Good morning, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the penultimate day of the ninth annual Edinburgh Traditional Building Festival. I am Tyler Lott Johnston. I'm convener of the Edinburgh Traditional Building Forum, and I'll be your host for today's events. For those of you joining us for the first time, we do invite you to sign up for tickets for all the other shows. All events are being recorded and made available for playback. So you'll have until Friday evening to get your tickets and be on the list for when the recordings go out. So that way you can catch up in your own time because we know you're all busy. Now, a colleague of mine has always said, a building should have a good hat, a nice coat, and a good pair of boots. Well, today is roofing day and we're talking about all things to do with the building's hat. One of our most important things that you can do for your building is to ensure that the roof is in good condition, especially in light of the impacts of climate change. So here in Scotland, we're fortunate enough to still widely use the magnificent traditional roofing skill of lead work. For many of us, the only opportunity we have to see the, this mastercraft is from afar as it gleams in the sunlight. However, with the festival, we're all about helping you get to know these crafts up close and personal. That's why this year we're pleased to have John McKinney be able to go on scene and behind the scenes with us to film an in-depth look at some of the lead work demonstrations. Now, these are on, um, these were presented by Steve McLennan. He's the chairman of the National Federation of Roofing Contractors in Scotland, and we were joined by his team at Greyfriars Roofing. Now, as a reminder, to ensure that you have the best experience possible, please close down all unnecessary programs and windows on your device to ensure that the bandwidth is optimal. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat and tell us where you're tuning in from today because that's always really fun to see. Now, you can also feel free to add any questions that you might have throughout the Q&A section and you can do that while the video is playing so you don't forget your questions or you can do it towards the end, whatever works for you. Now, as this is a practical de building demonstration, please note that there will be some occasional loud noises and uses of tools. So please feel free to adjust the volume on your computer to your preference. Now, thank you again for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoyed this behind the scenes look at the wonderful skill of lead roofing. Give me a moment and I will just share my screen. Hello and welcome to the ninth annual Edinburgh Traditional Building Festival, part of the Festival Fringe. Today we are on site with Steve McLennan, the chairman of the NFRC for Scotland and his team at Greyfriars Roofing. We're gonna be doing the lead roofing demonstration and they are um, going to be showing us a little bit about what they do. Now. Steve and his team have kindly supported the Edinburgh Traditional Building Festival since its inception. As you know, we weren't able to be on site for the demonstration last year, so we're really happy to be able to do it with you today. So Steve, if you and your team would like to take it over from here, we'd love Thank to you. see more. Thank you very much, Tyler. Hi there. So today we're going to be joined with Chris, the new CEO of Greyfriars, Charles, our fourth year apprentice, and Rhys, our second year apprentice. Today we're going to be demonstrating a simple lead platform with a little bit clad in and we'll finish off with a little bit capping just to show you the malleability of lead and we'll talk about some details therein. So before we get started we're going to start off by Reese fabricating the next piece of lead to go in place. Reese, over to you. So Reese is going to be fabricating uh, a lead panel. It's going to take him a few moments. So what Reese has done is got it marked out and we're fabricating this lead panel so that we're going to weld the junctions on, on this and he's going to be doing an undercloak and overcloak and Charles will be fitting it. So what we could do once Reese starts to get this fabrication going. We're then going to watch Charles who's going to start working on the sheet that we've prepared earlier, which is on our rig. So these are all set sizes. This is a Code 5 lead that we're using. And Reese, who is our second year apprentice, is in the early stages of conducting, getting these fabricated and is already looking good. Now, 
nice. So Reese was in the process there of just marking out the lines on the set sizes to get a nice sharp upstand so that the, the lead will fit in position more easily. One of the great things about lead and it being so malleable is its durability. So that's Reese got the overcloak ready. Now we're going to look at the undercloak and we can explain what these are for in a few moments. So usually the lead will be fabricated out of position then when it's ready to be installed be taken over check that it fits and then put in place This is Reese's first visit to the festival and already looking very comfortable. So Reese is just finishing off the, the, the bit of the, the fabrication with the, the rear up stand at the back of the lead bay. Now, I think after this so far, we can leave it at that and then we'll move over to seeing Charles having a look at the already installed lead sheet. Charles, maybe if you would like to just move to the undercloak. So what we have in here is a lead bay with a bit of wood core roll. You'll see that the wood core roll is shaped to prevent wind lift. This is specific to lead and this is used to divide up the panels that allow the lead to expand and contract. Charles is going to just dress a little bit of this in and then pop his mask on and weld up an internal corner. Reese, do you want to, is the turning gear ready for him? So during the welding operation, we do wear a mask just to prevent any inhalation of the fumes from the lead. This is a very typical design what we have is the wood rolls on any size of a platform. The, the length of the bay determines what code of lead we're using. Because we're only on a small rig here, we're just using a code 5 lead, but it can go up to anything to code 10. The difference in the codes gives you the difference in the length of the panel. We have a set size for the maximum width 
would be up to 750 mil. For this purpose, they're sitting about 600 mil. So we have a, an oxy acetylene weld. So the oxyacetylene flame is at a heat to melt the lead and join the two pieces together. The initial weld will join the lead and then the next weld will just smarten it up. So we'll go over it twice. Typically on a roof, if we can do this welding off the roof, then it'll be fabricated with it welded and then it'll be sat in place to cut down on welding in situ. Lead is a fabulous material for allowing this welding process to happen. So once we've initially got that welded together, we then go over and tidy it up. Have we got a bit of material to cut any ties, Reese? Have we got a just three or four ties of maybe a bit of lead there. We can get look to these to get welded at some point as well. Very good. So that's our back corner now watertight and welded there. And we'll be looking to put next the under cloak, which will then sit halfway up the divided bit wood roll for phase two to fit in the sheet. Charles is dressing into position now with the lead taken halfway up the undercloak onto the wood roll with the little lug to be a welded joint. The front of the roll is cut at a 45 degree angle. This allows for the bossing in the front of the wood roll all of which is detailed in our lead handbook a little bit of heat is also used just to allow for the malleability with a rubber mallet to dress the lead over Gently heat the lead. Use the rubber mallet to boss the lead, dress the lead over the front face of the wood core roll. a drip plate to save any nurgling and allowing for a nice clean finish.
very nice chap. So that's an undercloak post round the front edge of the wood roll. This is now ready for the upstand overcloak of the next sheet. Because lead is all about the expansion and contraction, the fixings are very important. Super. On the undercloak, it's only the top third of the sheet that is fixed. This allows for the rest of the lead bay to expand and contract, but not slippage. I have no slippage where it's not required or unnecessary. What we're going to do in this instance is just to weld on the undercloak and that seals it. Again, just a bit of welding. Popping on that mask and we're good to go. So we can see the nailing on the undercloak 50 mil apart and no more, as I say, than one third of the sheet. So all the details that we use when we're doing the lead work, it's all about expansion and contraction. Every piece of lead that we put in has a specific fix in with the aid of lead ties to hold it in place, prevent wind lift, and that ensures its longevity. Maybe a wee bit difficult to see this one. But. So again, when we're using this torch, we're frequently changing the flame so that the heat of the flame suits the condition and the, the weld that we're looking to weld. Some welds are easier than others. This one, fairly tricky weld. So we'll have a minimum flame. Great job, Charles. Now, for the purposes of this, uh, we'll just move on to fit in the next sheet, but that would have had a second run that looking lovely. And that is the undercloak of a lead bay. And this has produced a maximum of so many sheets, any size of platform. Okay, now we can shift the tools and bring in the next sheet that Reese has fabricated. And we'll have a look at the overcloak. I think we can maybe stop the thing for a second. The, the lead bay that Reese has fabricated, we're going to see if it fits, and then we're going to have Charles have a look at fitting it and then doing the overcloak, which is predominantly the important part on the platform. So, Reese, would you like to see if your sheet fits there? Typically, this can weigh on a bit code 8 of anything up to 110 kilos and not quite as easily lifted into sit position as this one here. Look at that, Reese. What a fabulous job. <laughs> You're a wizard. Well man. done. <laughs> so Good then, job. Reese would be away making the next one up and we'll get Charles to come in and we can see how we do the overclock on the lead bay. Charles. So 
So what we do now, we'll dress in along the bottom line just after the fabrication so that it dresses in to the bottom of the wood roll which again this prevents any wind lift but allows for contraction and expansion. So the lead is folded over the wood roll with enough lead to allow for a splash lap hand dressed in situ with the aid of a lead dresser. Reese will be moving on to getting the next part which is the cladding ready as Charles is finishing off the over. Again, a little bit of heaps, heat helps with the malleability in the dressing of the lead. helps to get that lead in position ready for another heat and then dressed in not too tight to the wood roll but enough to prevent any wind lift and allow for that important expansion and contraction. Typically a worn dresser is used in this process rather than a sharp Now see how it's delayed forming round the wood roll. And in a moment we'll have a look at the front where it gets heated and bossed round the 45 degree of the wood roll in the front of the sheet. Ready for welding now, and we'll perchance look at the front the lead bay where it gets bossed round the wood roll. Crossing the lead, we're finding where the end of that wood roll is, using the rubber mallet to push the lead outwards and allowing it to fit neatly round the shape of the wood.
though we can see how the overcloak is dressed over the undercloak. The rubber mallet working the lead so that it fits neatly over the end of the wood roll. You got a saw there? It's okay, very nice. Need a bit of a heat. We can see how the ledge dressed into the, the wood core roll. Very nice indeed. <clears throat> so what we have now is the overcloak put in place. All it needs now is to be trimmed 50mm wide and there we have a lead sheet with an under overcloak, an internal corner we're now going to show you a little bit clad in once we've welded some ties on that will help hold the clad in in place. What we'll show you in a second here now is just a bit of welding on the rear of the overcloak just to seal that up. So as always when we're dealing with lead, it's all about every piece of lead that we install is all about expansion and contraction. Okay, we're just going to so we're just going to weld the overcloak this can be bossed also welding on quad fives just gives it that nice bit extra strength
during this welding we have to get the flame right in there to the, the point of the lead where the two can be joined together. You can see by the nice clean weld the mixture of uh, acetylene and oxygen gives a nice clean weld. Lovely. Okay. Very good Charles. You could do a little bit more just for the people's back home just to finish that off that little bit. Beautiful. Next, we're going to weld some lead clips on. This will hold, this will help to hold the cladding in place, allow it to contract and expand, prevent any wind lift. Again, as we see, we're just lead to lead. even if it's a little bit tighter into the corner it will help hold in the corner Charles just for yeah. just for demonstration purposes super We can see how he's using his right hand to balance the torch. This allows for a nice weld using both hands, one hand to balance, the other hand to get the other hand to get the weld in motion. And that's us ready with our lead ties for the next bit of cladding. So Reese is now preparing the next piece of cladding. So what we have here on the cladded piece of lead is the lead turned so it's going to have a welted joint. These are typically, typically fixed with copper strip, copper nails to hold it in place. For the purposes of our demonstration, we'll just be showing you the welts today. Very nice
So we can see here that the next piece of lead will be dressed, fabricated and all. So for the next part of today's demonstration we're going to show you a piece of cladded lead. This will fit over the upstand of the lead bay and with a copper nail fixing and some copper clips this will hold it in place but again allow it to expand and contract. Reese, if you would. Charles, could you put that into position? You can see the previously welded lead ties help to hold it in situ. And again, the nailing with copper nails holds it in place and then a copper clip Copper nails holding it in place, and then let's have a look at the copper tie, Charles. So the copper tie holds the lead in place and still allows for the expansion and contraction, the use of the semen pliers to hold it tight onto the lead in that detail. A couple of lead ties, copper ties, every three fifty to 400 centers. For the day's demonstration, two copper clips is enough. Let me assist. Copper nails on a copper tie hold it in place. Well done. So we're now ready to fit on the next piece of cladding. Reese? Have you got that piece ready? So again, cladding can only be in a specific size, typically up to 2 metres in length and approximately 600 mil wide. We can see the two pieces are bonded together. So now that the cladding's been fixed into position, it'll now get lightly dressed and will define the line, which will still allow the expansion and contraction, but of course, stop any ingress.
We're now going to take the dresser down the outside of the welted joint. Got our lead bay, our cladding piece that could be finished with a flash in or a cap in, lead ties. Charles will, will clip the lead ties. And then it would get a patination oil just to stop any staining. And that's a typical lead platform with cladded wall. All in lead. Red ties cut and clipped all to form holding the lead in place to allow it to move and there we have a platform and lead cladded panel. All right, thank you so much for that wonderful video. And again, thank you so much to John McKinney for being on site to be able to do the, the filming for that. It was so wonderful be, to be able to see the details up close and personal, finally. I know when we've done these types of demonstrations in the past, it's usually people crowding around the rig just to kind of be able to get a look. But with the camera, we've been able to get in there quite closely and hopefully provide you with some eyes in order to see um, maybe up close like you wouldn't be able to before. So Steve, if you'd like to join us for the um, Q&A session, I know uh, Steve is actually uh, joining us from his car. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to be able to be with us today. How are you? I think you've got a little bit of a delay too in terms of um, you know the service. So we'll wait for you. How you doing, Steve? Oh, the joys of technology, right? It allows us to be anywhere, but sometimes it's only on its terms. Um, okay, there you are. I think we've got you, Steve. You there? We can see you. <laughs> okay, Steve, let me know when you can hear me. We can also try without the camera on if that saves on your, your bandwidth on your phone too. Maybe we should try that first. Because I know we've got a lot of questions coming in throughout the video, I was able to see that. And so that was quite helpful um, just to see you know, that you're engaged and um, have those questions coming in. So Steve, now that we've got the video off, we wanna test and see if we can hear you. 
you know, and we tested this beforehand. We made sure it worked. Anything? Okay, maybe um, what we'll be able to do is give him another minute in order to just um, get his uh, connection up to speed a little bit more. I know he is in kind of a remote location. So that's one of the things, um, you know, with, with hosting online events and, and allowing people to, to be a part of them sometimes when, you know, we tune in, it's not always the best connection. So Robert, thank you so much for your comment in the chat. Uh, Robert said, fascinating, great work from the team. Thanks. So thanks Robert Strain for that um, comment there. So I'll check again. I know we've got another more questions coming in. So do feel free, put those questions in the Q&A section. And then when we can um, get Steve on audio, we'll be able to um, answer those with him here. Now, of course, worst case scenario, if for some reason we're not able to get those Q&As um, put together, what we can actually do is I can set up a time to, to do the Q&As with him separately and then be able to include those in the film that's distributed later. Of course, that's not what we want. Um, and we definitely want you to be able to ask those questions live right now, but um, we've always got to have that plan on hand, right? Okay. Let's see, I will look through really quickly and see if there is any, probably not any that I have. Um, Robert, I see that you have your hand raised. Is there a question you have? Um, well, I, I, look at me raising my own hand when I'm trying to figure out what to do. It's a day for technology, isn't it, everyone? Um, if you have your question, you can put it in the Q&A section there. I don't believe that we have the capability to allow you to come on live. Um, but we do have the opportunity for him to go into the Q&A section. So um, let's do this. Let's take a quick little break. I will mute myself and pause the video and I will get in touch with Steve. You go make a, a cup of tea, do what you need to do, take a comfort break. And then in, let's say two minutes. So at 1152, hopefully um, we will come back on and we will have a plan. So give yourself a quick break and we'll be right back.
Okay, so I was able to get in touch with Steve and it seems that it is a um, actually an issue with Zoom that we're having right now. So he is working on a quick fix and hopefully we can get him back in and able to answer the questions. We do have another option in order to do it. We could always put him on speaker on the phone, um, but as we're not sure of the quality, we want to make sure that um, we kind of have our best kind of opportunity to do that here. So um, I do have um, some assistance, thankfully from John McKinney in the background, helping us to get it back together. Um, but it looks like John is actually calling me right now. So I'm gonna have to um, go off camera for just a minute. So thank you so much for your patience and we'll be right back. Okay, everyone. So it looks like we have hopefully a temporary fix for this. And actually we're gonna keep John on speakerphone on my, on my actual phone and be able to ask him the questions there. So unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to see his face, but we do have him here with us. So, you know, Steve, thank you so much for being with us today. Really, really appreciate it. Um, so yeah. how are you? Yeah, no, Aside from tactical difficulties. Now, can if everyone can kind of just put in the chat, make sure that we can hear him. Can you hear Steve? Someone can just give me a thumbs up or anything like that in the chat. I'd greatly appreciate it, just so because I want to make sure that you can hear. Okay, John, thank you so much for confirming we can hear. So, Steve, we do have questions coming in. Are you okay if we okay. just jump right in? Yes. Okay, perfect. So the court, first one is, you mentioned that Reese and Charles are apprentices. How long is the apprenticeship, and do they go to college? So the apprenticeship is for four years, um, fairly normal apprenticeship time, same as a plumber. Generally, the, the lead workers have came from plumbers. So I was a, a plumbing apprentice, four years. Uh, lead work was part of the plumbing, uh, plumbing apprenticeship, but now we've diversified into the lead apprenticeship being for four years. Okay. Um, so it's a four-year apprenticeship. Oh, wonderful. And, and do they go to college for that? That was the second part of that question. I want to make sure that so we answer it. The, we don't actually qualify for that at the moment. I definitely pick it up a college. Okay. The only college that is available to us is down in Essex. Oh. As we can imagine, that's quite a journey. So we're definitely trying to set up some kind of apprenticeship, whether that be in the lead contractors and or uh, an, an independent college up in Scotland. But no, we generally just are teaching in-house okay. and being part of the lead contractors association to participate in the guide to good practice means that they're, they're getting well taught and by professional standards. No, that, that's really helpful. And, you know, for, for those of you in the audience, if you are interested in helping to set up uh, an apprenticeship college or something like that, do get in touch with Steve, because as you heard, he's definitely, you know, there are quite a few people in um, the roofing profession who are looking for that, because no, they shouldn't have to go to Essex in order to get this training, especially when we know that, you know, roofing in Scotland is quite unique as well. So we want to make sure they get that training. And I'm so glad to hear that they get it on site as well. I think that's incredibly useful and um, right. wonderful to hear. So our next question we have is says, seeing the use of heat, what precautions do contractors working with the heat take to ensure there are no fires on site? So typically we'll have two to three 75, 80 litre of fire extinguishers, okay. a powder extinguisher and a fire blanket. We also have in place a hot work permit system whereby we detail what section of the roof we're working on, what time we've started 
working on that section. It's signed in the morning, and then it's signed off typically at least two hours before, so 2 o'clock to 30 in the afternoon. There'll be no welding carried out, and there'll be a check for at least an hour to two hours before the leave site on the areas that we've been welding on, and we'll typically weld off-site in the fabrication uh, before install the lead. So a fairly robust uh, condition on the use of welding on roofs and if we can be inside of the building to ensure there's no smoke and or heat or flames or anything out of the ordinary, then these are the precautions that are typically used when we're welding on site. Okay, that's really good to hear. And I think that's a really good question considering, you know, the recent fire that we've had in, in Edinburgh's old town. So understanding those precautions that you take and the importance of, you know, even going in the building once you're done, I think that that's incredible. So thank you for, for letting us know a little bit more about that. Um, so some of the other questions we have, one person has asked, if fitted correctly, how long do you expect a lead roof to last? I mean, that's a good one. Okay, so typically, I would say, let's say, a, a Code 8 platform. Now, a Code 8 platform typically means that the weight of the lead would be 41 kilos per square metre. This can be fitted in up to 3 metres in length, and if allowed to expand and contract uh, as it should be, I don't see why it wouldn't last at least 100 years. Now, again, when I'm asked this question, it's... it's figure on it because if the lead can expand and contract I really don't know why it would need to be lifted or re redone at any time it just lead just seems to go on and on and on so I would say a code platform well fitted minimum 100 years that's amazing. I mean, I think considering that the whole theme around this festival is sustainability, when we're looking at roofing materials, knowing that, you know, you could put a roof on your, la on your building that could last 100 years and look gorgeous, if I can say so myself, um, yeah. that's, that's a really big bonus when you look at everything. Um, wow, great. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure one of the caveats is that it's done right. And that's one of the reasons why you need to get a good roofing contractor and that's you know the nfrc or the national federation for roofing contractors is a great way of you know finding a, a good quality that's contractor right. near you as well and of course you know steve we've worked with you for a long time so you know we we do appreciate that Greyfriars is an incredible um roofing contractor as well so there's tons in your area and definitely do look into that as well yeah. um so some more questions we've got and um, I will go down to the ones who are so brave to put their names next to it, because I like that. Um, Merlin Lewis says, great video, very impressed by the pace of work. Please, could you explain if and when you use patination oils when working with lead? So patination oil is a, a product that's been around for, let's say, we've used it the last 20 years. What would happen when you're fitting a new piece of lead it would come with an, a film from the uh, where it's been produced in the in the, the kilns, and this would have a slight oily texture to it. When initially rainfall hits this textured oil, you get a, a staining, you get a white residue that runs off the lead. Now, the patination oil is an oil that counteracts the staining. Okay. To stop it being on glass or on slates, it takes we, we use a covering of the patination oil and it counteracts the, the staining on any other materials nearby. Well, a, a counter product of patination oil is that it gives us this dark, complex feel to the lead. So, in many instances, people like to use the patination oil just to give it the je ne sais quoi finish to the lead. Uh, but really, in practice, it's to stop staining, and that's why we're using the patination oil. Oh, that's really good to know, especially for homeowners. So when you have a contractor who is talking to you about these products, you know, understanding why they're used and how they're used in what um, certain applications is really important. So that's a really good question. Thank you for submitting that one. So the next one we have is from Mark W. It says, how does zinc differ? 
less malleable and shorter lived, but a lot cheaper and less vulnerable to theft, question mark? Well, is drink again is another uh, quality product that is used wild, widely in construction these days. And maybe there's uh, instances where either lead or zinc could be used. But uh, certainly in many recent years, I've not noticed a lot of theft of lead. Um, okay. And maybe it just comes down to a preference. Uh, many of our heritage buildings uh, are basically lead used. And um, it's maybe a, a choice. A modern modern buildings are more used for zinc these days, whereas our old heritage buildings uh, are more used with lead. So again, it's maybe a preference, but both are good materials. Um, I would typically say that lead up on a roof uh, would be my choice of material. Uh, again, zinc can be used. Uh, it's an either or. So. Okay. And either or. That's that's good to know. I mean, always knowing the options and the types of materials is quite helpful. Um, and you know, you made a good, really good point when it comes to heritage structures. And those are you know generally the older or more traditional buildings. Um, but sometimes, especially if it's a building of significance, practitioners prefer to use the original materials and maintain that as well, not just for its aesthetic. But um, a colleague of mine had used the analogy of you know, if you're making your grandmother's cake, are you gonna use the same ingredients? Or are you gonna change things up if you want the same outcome? And so that's a good way to think about um, the material choices and things of that sort as well. So, um, so we've got two more questions. So one says expansion and contraction of lead. From your experience, Steve, um, is climate change increasing the amount of contraction and expansion or the code of lead, which needs to be specified for any work? No, I don't think so, Tyler. If we that piece of lead and it gets a little bit hotter, uh, uh, climate change, uh, we haven't seen yet that we have. <laughs> You're breaking up a little bit there. Steve, we're, we're still breaking up a little bit. Sorry. The best laid plans, right? Typically, uh, five mils. So, so I haven't seen any instances yet where climate change is needed that we have to increase the knowledge like trash and abusing. Okay. Yeah. So that is not clear. 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 Okay, Steve, I recognize that you answered the question. Unfortunately, there was a very unique response um, that came through via technology and it was a little jumbled. Can we try answering that one one more time? Yeah, Taylor, oh, there you go, you're back. Basically, no, we haven't yet noticed that okay. climate change is making us rethink our expansion and contraction parameters. So at the moment, we're still working to the same parameters we always have, even though there is a slight or there is climate change. Okay, that's really, really good to know. Thank you. And I think one of the great things that you saw in the demonstration is the amount of material overlap that's used um, in, in order to allow for that expansion and contraction. Because like yes. you said, if you want it to last for 100 years, you've got to put those contingencies in place and make sure that it's available to do that. So that's really great. Um, so we have one more question and um, then we will wrap up because, oh, we've got another one coming in. Um, but I do want to be very cognizant of your time, Steve. How are you? Okay. We've got two questions. Do you have time to answer them? I have time, Taylor. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So um, the, the next one says, has increased rainfall affected lead roofing? I'm thinking more about the outlets, hoppers, and downpipes being able to accommodate the increase, increased levels of rain during flash flooding. 
the, the increase in rainfall has affected all aspects of roofing, not just lead on roofing. Mm -hmm. the, typically, we would have to ensure that we have overflows in place and a more robust maintenance plan. So the increase in rainfall has not really changed or changed lead work, but we do need to ensure that maintenance is more carried out and that we do have overflow systems in place. You know, that's a really good point when it comes to maintenance because you know, you can you can do all of the work to put the materials out there, but if you're not maintaining your structure, then ultimately, un unfortunately, it's not going to live up to its part of the bargain either. So um, yeah. if anyone's interested in maintenance types ideas, we do have um, National Maintenance Week at the end of November. So that's going to be another event that we're going to be involved with in order just giving practical maintenance tips and things like that for your, your home as well. Um, so, Steve, we've got one more question. It says, are there health implications to working with lead? And it says in parentheses, a poison. Or is there is the risk greater in smelting that, than in reworking lead? Well, there's always a, a health issue with lead in that we really need to wear that mask when we're welding. But bearing in mind that most of this work's carried outside, and we're not in confined spaces. So on a, in a factory setting, we would need to ensure there was adequate ventilation. And as long as our hygiene is in place to allow washing of hands before eating food uh, and wearing that mask before welding, then really the, the health issues are, are negligible. As long as we're taking care of the hygiene and wearing the mask, then we're okay. And no, apart from that, if we stick to these, then there's not really a health issue. Okay, that's really good. Now I've had one more come in. Um, and if that's okay, uh, yeah. we can go for that. It says, Neil Woodhouse is asking or, or saying, exposure to driving rain is area specific. Can you expand on this? And I know you're not necessarily a cl climate expert, but I would kind of um, maybe say, is there something in particular to the lead roofing when it comes to driving rain that you have to maybe account for, or is it? Kind well, of yes, a, in, a, in a sense, Tyler, we maybe change a detail to allow for a heavier downpour. Mm -hmm. So instead of maybe having, say, a water gate, we would install a storm roll, which would just allow for a heavier rainfall in a certain situation of water coming off a roof. But generally, the, uh, again, regarding your granny's cake, these uh, lead details have been looked at over the last hundred years to see which ones work. And looking at them, um, no. Uh, even the, you can throw many or uh, any weather at a lead roof. And if it's put in properly, it's again making sure that water can get off the roof with an overflow but heavy and increased rainfall and well driving rain, if installed correctly, lead seems to be up to it. Well, that's really good to hear. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that is the end of all of our questions for this session. So Steve, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we go? Well, I always enjoy these occasions. I'm sorry that we're not at the, the Bakehouse this year and hopefully we can get back to the Bakehouse yet, uh, next year. I would like to say thank John McKinney for his excellent video and yourself, Tyler, for your time and coming out and presenting. It's really good. So uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and thanks to everyone for their questions. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Steve, for your time. We really appreciate it. And, um, you know, the comments are coming in about how much they love the presentation and everything. So thank you so much. Well, again, Tyler, thank you for Thank you for setting everything up and making it so easy. So oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Steve. You have a great day. Okay. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye now. So thank you so much, everyone, for your patience and um, your understanding technology, right? Um, but we're glad we were able to make that work and have Steve here with us on the phone because he has such great wisdom in order to impart. And if um, you have any other questions, you can feel free to reach out to us. And, you know, like we said, Steve is with the NFRC and he's always 
able to, and, and willing to answer tons of questions. Um, that's it for this morning. Now we will have another um, presentation on roof slating and tiling at two o'clock. Again, it's roof day, so um, the celebrations will continue. So if you would like to make sure you sign up for that event. Again, they're being recorded and we'll be able to share them with you if you can't join us live. So have an absolutely wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you later. Bye.